Good afternoon. Uh, I will talk about the evolution of the Fermi surface of a dope topological superconductor, uh, insulator, but a superconductor will be mentioned, with care concentration. We're moving away from the atomically clean limit. Uh, this is a work, uh, this is a collaboration done with uh, Eran Maniv and myself from uh, Yoram Dagan's group and Amit Kanigel's group from the Technion. So very shortly on bismuth selenide, which was just mentioned in the previous talk, uh, it has a nearly ideal Dirac, uh, single Dirac cone, has relative to this field a relatively large band gap, quite small for a semiconductor, but it allows the Dirac cone to persist to room temperatures in principle. But as you've heard, uh, in reality when you cook this material in the lab, it's uh, very almost impossible to make it completely insulating in the bulk. So you, in the end, you have a bulk contribution to the conductivity. Uh, you can modify the carrier concentration of the bulk by various chemical techniques. Uh, especially, you can increase the, uh, the bulk carrier concentration further, if you somehow want to, by copper intercalation. So um, actually, it was then found by uh, the uh, it was found that uh, this material becomes uh, superconducting at uh, 3.8 Kelvin, uh, and uh, a single Dirac. Uh, it, it consists. It has a single Dirac cone in ARPES. Um, it, for a particular uh, range of copper uh, doping. So, an interesting question would be. Okay, this is a topological insulator, and it has it has a single Dirac cone, and it's superconducting. Could it be a realization of a time reversal invariant 3D topological superconductor? And uh, to that end, uh, Liang Fu, who will talk tomorrow, and uh, Erez Berg constructed a set of criteria uh, for uh, this material being this time reversal invariant 3D topological superconductor. And one of them, which is important to our work, is that it has uh, to uh, have a Fermi surface which is closed inside the brilliant zone. Uh, for bismuth, uh, copper dope bismuth selenide, it means that uh, the Fermi surface should be closed for it to enclose the, oh, sorry, the gamma one point in the center of the brilliant zone. Uh, there was a work by Luli's group in, on the, the hasman alfen effect, uh, and which showed that this Fermi surface uh, should be, uh, is, looks like a closed ellipsoid, uh, up to the, their measurement range. So it seems that it could comply with uh, the Fuenberg criteria. But later, uh, Amit Kanigel's group had ARPES measurements which showed uh, with their special sensitive, uh, bulk sensitive technique, which uh, Amit Ribak will uh, show you in the, the next uh, talk after me. Uh, they showed that actually, uh, they see that the, actually the Fermi surface of the bulk of copper dove bismuth cyanide is actually open. So what we were trying to uh, reconcile, to, see, to examine, is whether, whether is, it, is it open or closed, and we were using the shubnikov de Haas effect in very high magnetic fields. Uh, so in very short, I won't uh, exhaust you with the details, but the shubnikov de Haas uh, effect is just oscillations in the magnetic resistance. You analyze the data and you get at the frequency of these oscillations, and according to the Onsager relation, this frequency is directly proportional to the cross section of the Fermi surface in the direction of the magnetic field. And if you want to, in this, with this technique, you can map the shape of your entire Fermi surface if you tilt the sample relative to the magnetic field, or the other way around, and you measure the frequency at different tilt angles, and then you can reconstruct the Fermi surface. 
Uh, for example, if you have a, a Fermi surface which looks like a perfect sphere, then the, this frequency will be a constant uh, because the cross-sectional area is constant, uh, no matter which angle you look. But if you uh, have an open Fermi surface which looks like a cylinder, say, the frequency will go as one over cosine theta. Um, now to our measurements. Uh, so with, uh, we measured three uh, main uh, carrier concentrations. Uh, we measured the carrier concentration with the Hall effect. Uh, the low and middle range carriers uh, we used were just bismuth selenide prepared in different, uh, uh, diff with the same technique but with, in different conditions. And uh, the high, uh, the higher carrier concentration we looked at, which was 10 to the 20th over centimeter cube, was copper doped bismuth selenide, which was in the superconducting range. We measured the superconducting transition. I'm not showing it here, but we did. And uh, ARPES measurements showed a, a linear, perfectly linear Dirac cone for all uh, these samples. And also, there was also always the bulk band, the bulk band observed, finite bulk conductivity. Uh, so the Shubnikov Das effect in the lowest uh, range of carriers um, measured uh, a completely uh, a closed Fermi surface, some ellipsoid. Uh, we, you see here we measured. Oh, this is okay. Um, this is for up to 14 Tesla. Uh, for uh, 10 to the 19th, one over centimeter cube, the middle range, bismuth selenide, we measured uh, also a closed Fermi surface, slightly more elongated. This is up to 30 and 33 Tesla also. And now what will happen when we increase the carrier density further? Will it elongate some more? Will it be closed? So we measured that also. And what we actually get that the, is that the frequency scales with one over cosine theta. And which means that we're measuring uh, the cylindrical scenario, an open Fermi surface. We measured this actually for quite a few samples. And this repeats itself. The frequency goes as one over cosine theta. What does it mean? It means that, um, so we got in the lower carrier density, we saw that the Fermi surface is closed. That you increase the f f carrier density, it becomes more elongated. You go to the carrier density at which it, it is superconducting, but it's higher carrier density. The Fermi surface becomes so long that it's no longer entirely contained in the, in the brilliant zone, and for the uh, conduction purposes, it's open. So it's actually, it actually doesn't fit to a perfect one over cosine theta dependence, a perfect cylinder. We actually fitted, uh, we found that a better fit is a corrugated cylinder model. Uh, we used a simple tight binding model and with our data, with our frequency data, we reconstructed the Fermi surface. And so we got a corrugated cylinder uh, but for a corrugated cylinder, you would expect to get uh, two frequencies because you have two cross sections, the one in the middle of the brilliant zone and the one on the brilliant zone boundary. But we don't so to see two frequencies, we see one very distinguished frequency. So we had the two explanations for that. One of them is that uh, actually the difference between the two frequencies should be very small within 5%, which is uh, problematic with the precision, precision of this experiment. If you want to have a higher precision, you need even higher magnetic fields. Uh, and also, we use the, the ARPES measurements to extract the effective mass of uh, uh, effective mass um, when you go um, dependence on KZ in the brilliant zone. And what we found is that the high, if you go from the middle of the brilliant zone 
to uh, the Boolean zone boundary, the mass, the effective mass increases by about a factor of two. And if you remember in the Shumnikov das effect, there's a, an exponential sensitivity to the effective mass. And the, the higher the mass, the more suppressed will be the oscillation amplitude. So actually, the, the, the second frequency, the one from the Brillion zone boundary, will have uh, a lesser contribution, which is difficult to discern uh, within the experiment uh, precision. So uh, to conclude, uh, so we measured three carrier densities of bismuth selenide. Uh, the last one, the highest one, is copper dot bismuth selenide, which is superconducting. Uh, we find that the Fermi surface uh, grows in the KZ direction from uh, an ellipsoid to a more elongated ellipsoid to a, an open corrugated cylinder at the highest carrier density, which means it, it, it doesn't close inside the brilliant zone. And actually, the Fuhnberg criteria is not satisfied because uh, we now the Fermi surface encloses, encloses two points, two time reversal invariant momenta points, which are the gamma and uh, the Z points. The Z is the one on the brilliant zone boundary. So these results cast doubt on copper dove bismuth selenide being a possible realization of a time reversal invariant uh, 3D topological superconductor. But at the time, we suggested that it could be a realization of a 2D-like weak topological superconductor. And uh, more about that you will hear in uh, Amit Ribak's talk after me and Lian Fu's talk tomorrow. Thank you for your attention.